Good morning. My guest is Dr. Baxter Montgomery. He's one of our featured keynotes for today at the plant-based conference that we call the Food Summit. Thanks for having me. Yes. Well, let me just ask, let's get right into it. Dr. Montgomery, everybody wants to know, how did you get started? What was your journey toward plant-based? Because I'm going to take the assumption that you were not always plant-based. That's correct. You know, I get that question asked a lot, and it's, it's um, I think each time I approach the answer, it's a little bit of a different angle because it's actually a complex answer. It was more of an evolutionary process for me. You know, I, um, in my medical training, I was always interested in health and wellness and prevention. Uh, as a cardiology trainee, I always wanted to have a wellness center, so to speak. I didn't really know what that meant. I mean, we had cardiac rehab and exercise and maybe eating healthy, but what that meant I wasn't sure of. As I got into private practice and, and became busy, I got married, family, and so on, you know, my health progressively deteriorated over time. Now, I always had an interest in health and getting my patients healthier, but I really didn't know how to approach that. However, when I started having my own health problems, I started you know, researching different approaches to natural cures. I didn't want to take the same medication I prescribed for my, my patients or undergo the same procedure. So I, I did know that I wanted to avoid those things. So what did I need to do to avoid those things? And that was sort of the, the underlying question and, and, and thing that I tried to research. And as I read through you know, different approaches, there were a lot of you know, things outside of standard medicine you know, different uh, supplements and herbs and et cetera. And of course, different diets, you know, of, of various types. And I experimented with all of them. I realized one underlying theme of most health recommendations was eating, you know, your vegetables, eating fruit. And so a natural plant-based diet was at least part of every, you know, dietary regimen that there was. So one day out of the blue, and I don't know how this came about, you know, I took a raw vegan chef course, a weekend crash course. And during that weekend, I learned about plant-based nutrition. Uh, I got local resources. I connected with a local expert who, he was a CPA by training, and he used to, you know, coach people in juice feasting and the like. Uh, met with him, read a number of books, you know, that he recommended. Uh, underwent a raw, natural juice feast myself. Uh, had an amazing health change. So this is a personal uh, um, uh, uh, awakening for myself. Also, in the context of this journey, my mother had become ill, and I was in the process of researching, you know, herbal medicine, supplements, and things of the like, and had some positive benefits for her during her journey, but never really, you know, had was able to turn her health around. During her death, <clears throat> I realized a number of things. Now that I realized our typical way of treating patients was inadequate. But I also realized that a typical way of treating patients to a certain extent was harmful. You know, she died of liver failure as a result of the medications and, and the diet that she was on and the like. And, and this came about after reviewing her records extensively and so on. So it was a process of my personal journey for my health, experiencing the death of my mother, seeing how my patients turned around when I started applying these natural approaches to their lives. Uh, we saw patients, and I still see patients this day, with end-stage heart failure, with, with uh, advanced diabetes, uh, who are on 21, 30 medications, and we're able to turn them around in a matter of days to weeks. When I started applying this approach to these patients, you know, I was amazed, and I never ceased to be amazed with these changes because, you know, the effectiveness of this lifestyle change, you know, was very impactful in my life as well as on my patients' lives. You mentioned that you did not want to take the medicines or pre that you were prescribing. How did you resolve that conflict? You know, it's interesting because, um, you, you know, in medical training, you see your patients as your patients, but you don't see yourself as your patient. And as, of course, I got older, and, and I was always a fit person, exercised and the like, but, you know, life gets in the way and you stop exercising, you have more responsibilities and more stress, and so you start to take on these same chronic illnesses that you see your patients have. Uh, however, in my mind state, I never wanted to succumb to being a patient, if you will. And so I guess it was more of a psychological, you know, barrier that I had in terms of not wanting to be, be a patient, whether my own patient or someone else's patient. So although I, in some sense, believed that these medications were helpful, 
in the other sense, I didn't think they were for me. And so it, it was it was a conflict that I think I resolved just by my independent research and, you know, steadfast search for something else other than this approach. You said independent research. Uh, that implies that much of what you were learning or trying to learn on your own was not something that was part of the medical school curriculum. That's correct. <clears throat> That's correct. You know, it, in this process, and again, my journey started somewhere maybe about 15, 16 years ago. Um, it was before, you know, the internet uh, it was as easy to, you know, search. It was before social media was as prevalent. However, more and more things were, you know, becoming uh, available, you know, outside the traditional, you know, textbooks and encyclopedias. So as, you know, information became more available, my search process became, you know, easier. Um, but yes, I did read lay books by lay, the lay public, you know, books by scientists who were outside of the traditional medical uh, uh, field. Uh, I read articles and to some extent some studies that were in books that weren't in the main medical journals or in the main cardiology journals. So I had to hit the unbeaten path to find this information. You mentioned a term that I'd really like you to explain. You said a juice feast? That's correct, yes. So when I started out in the plant-based area, um, I started out looking at, uh, well, I took a raw vegan chef course. And so uh, there was a local plant-based, you know, um, she was really an animal rights advocate. And she had invited a raw vegan chef to the town to, to give a course. It was a crash course, weekend crash course. And so we learned about preparing raw plant-based food. That was my introduction to vegan food, is raw vegan food. And so when we learned this, and I learned the benefits of not heating food too high, the benefits of allowing the enzymes to maintain uh, uh, their, their, their architecture. So I felt the benefit of eating these foods, and, and eating the foods made me feel better. So then I learned about a young man who was in our city who coach people in juice feasting. Juice feast is where you, for a certain finite period of time, you don't eat at all. You get juice, uh, like carrots, uh, apples, celery, and you just juice them, run it through a Jack LaLanne juicer or you know, a cold pressed juicer of any type, and that's your meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you just drink juice 24-7. Now, my first juice feast was 33 days. So for 33 days, I ate nothing. I just drank raw juice of different varieties, vegetable juice, fruit juice, mixture thereof. I say within about the first five to 10 days, I felt like a new person. Uh, beyond 10 days, I had much more energy. I was waking up early, bright. You know, uh, my mental clarity was much greater. I had more energy, strength. Uh, it was just an amazing feeling. Um, every year I would do a juice feast. Since the first juice feast I started eating plant-based, I said, well, I can eat a vegan diet. It's pretty easy. And I maintained it. never went back. However, I ate vegan junk food uh, from time to time. So every year I would do a juice feast. I maybe do 20 days, 15 days, you know, 13 days, etc. After the juice feast, I'd feel much better. I realized that, okay, all vegan foods weren't created equal. So I started to think and say, well, look, you know, if I eat raw vegan food, that's one thing. If I eat something cooked, that's one thing. Something sauteed in oil, something fried, that's another thing. So I created a food classification system based on a numbering system from zero to 10 that looks at not only vegan food, but all, you know, standard American diet foods, 10 being the worst, zero being the healthiest. Well, juice, water, and anything that's liquefied is at level zero. It's the healthiest. Because I thought I found that not only my health improved faster, but when I started putting my patient on juice feasting, they, their health improved faster on the juice feast than it did on a regular cooked vegan diet or even a raw solid vegan diet. So I was able to differentiate at different levels of food based on the preparation method that if I wanted to get somebody who's very sick, healthy, faster, I put them on a lower numbering level. So all that started from my experience with juice feasting. And I've since done a 101-day juice feast where I went 101 days, nothing to eat, just raw juice, drinking. And I kid you not, you know, it's more of a mental exercise than it is a physical exercise. Because I was working out with a trainer. I exercised every day. I had more energy on day 51, 61, 68, 78, nothing to eat. 
just raw juice. Felt more energetic in that setting than I did eating solid foods. Tell me why you use juice as opposed to juicers, which left all of the fiber, versus blending, where you put it in more like a, not a commercial for Vitamix, but a Vitamix or one of the blenders where you were able to maintain all of the fiber. Why, the, why juice versus the blend? That's a good question. And, and you hear a lot of comments, and particularly the issue with fiber. And fiber is important, and I'm not saying it isn't. First of all, when, you've, when you cold press a juice, let's say I, you know, I sit in front of you, I run some carrots through a juicer, it's not totally devoid of the fiber. I mean, I have to do a little bit more work than that to absolutely remove all fiber. So there's some fiber when you're juicing uh, uh, juice. Even if you buy the cold pressed juices in the store, there's a certain amount of fiber. However, let's just say you're moving, removing most of the fiber. Part of the process of healing the body is to remove the work of metabolism. And we see in individuals who are ill, so let's say I have a congestive heart failure patient, and I give them, say, vegan food. If I give them, say, cooked greens or grains, et cetera, the body has to metabolize that, has to process that. So that's work, that's cardiac output that has to go to the GI system. But what if I then say, okay, take away the cooked foods, take away even the fiber, I'm gonna extract all the nutrients, or most of the nutrients, from the, 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 the food, and then I'm gonna have you drink it. So then the body is able to do two things. It's able to reduce the amount of work of metabolism, but be nourished at the same time. You know, we know that water fasting is a very good way of healing. However, water fasting has to be under very, you know, tight observation, it's very strict, because the body does heal under water fasting, but there's still, you know, a, a, a process that it goes through that you have to observe it faster. Juice feasting is another level up. It has similar healing processes as water fasting, but it has the benefit of the body getting the nourishment that it needs. So it gets protein, it gets minerals, it gets all the nutrients that are in the foods. Yes, it's the amount of fiber is minimized, but the actual hydration of the body system allows the body to eliminate. When I did a 101-day juice feast, I was eliminating uh, quite a bit on day 85, as much as I was on day 5, largely because the body eliminates based on the fact that hydration, fiber adds to that, allows water to be pulled into the GI system, but just sheer hydration can also allow you to eliminate as well. This whole notion of moving people toward raw, uh, so that we can be real clear with anyone who might see this, what do you mean when you say, to, I'm sorry, raw and cooked or not cooked? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that because, you know, labels can be misleading. And so if I were to sit in here with 10 different raw foodists and ask, what do you eat, what do you not eat? They would say much different things among them. So the, to, to get among the, beyond that confusion, we have the numbering system. So if you look at food classifications, the level zero, as I said, is a liquefied raw substance. That includes water. And uh, the exception, uh, the, the outlier, I should say, would be herbal teas that are also included in level zero. But in level zero are juices that extract the fiber and also smoothies that liquefy. So they're, they're all in level zero, but they're different subclasses of zero. So levels one, two, and three are raw solid foods. So let's say one is low glycemic index raw solid foods. Two, or three, I should say, is high glycemic index raw foods. Two is in the middle. So you got raw foods, low glycemic index, middle, and high glycemic index, raw solid foods. When you get to four, there's a transition period. There's a 4A, which is high fat content raw foods. An avocado is an example. A seed's another example. We, we intentionally put nuts. Nuts theoretically should be in 4A. We intentionally put nuts out to level six. The reason being is that oftentimes nuts are shell using heat processes and other mechanical processes that can bring heat to the nuts. So we're not always certain, so we don't allow that in our detox. That's more of an administrative uh, difference than it is a food difference. 4B is dehydrated foods. Now, raw foodists may consider dehydrated food, like a dehydrated bread or dehydrated cracker, to be raw. However, it's heated up to 108 degrees, 110 degrees sometimes. But a raw food is a purist may not eat that. Why? Because when you dehydrate something, you extract the water from it. So it may be classified as raw because what? The enzymes are alive, but the fact that the water is extracted from it 
makes it nutritionally deficient, defective compared to a food that has the water content in it. And, and I believe that because water is probably the number one nutrient. We talk about protein and minerals and vitamins. Water is probably the most important ingredient in most foods that we eat. So 4B is dehydrated, 4C is blanched or not even blanched but thawed. So like I would get frozen raw foods and thaw them up to room temperature using heat, that's a 4C. You're applying a little bit more heat to the food and heating it up. Level five and level six is boiled and steamed to different uh, time durations and different uh, temperatures. And so that's where you get the cooked uh, foods. Grilled, microwave, or all outside the scale. It's beyond seven, which is what we don't recommend. So this is an amazing gradation of, of things. I didn't think about there was such science, and I know you're going to be talking about this That's correct. later in the lectures that you're going to be giving. There are a couple other, other things. How did you reconcile this? You're a cardiologist. You see patients every day. How do you reconcile this with what the standards from which insurance companies base payment and everything on to the patients and your practice? Yeah, great question. So, you know, that uh, reconciliation process is evolving, and it has evolved over time. When I, when I started applying this to the patients, um, it was a one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, interaction. Again, this is after I experienced this myself. So I would see a patient, and I would write down, okay, I want you to eat only this, and I'd write down salad recipes. I would have to have to go to my break room and bring some of my lettuce and, and tomatoes and my, my salad ingredients to show them what a salad was. Because uh, many people didn't know, you know, well, what goes into a salad. Maybe they thought romaine lettuce or iceberg lettuce and some tomato slices. Um, but I had to show them how different ways of making a salad. I would do that in the exam room. I would actually write down the ingredients and recipes. Uh, okay, eat this for seven days and come back and see me. Uh, so what I would do, it would do it in the context of a clinic visit. Most of what I would talk about is what they eat, what they don't eat. And I would say, come back and do this. They would come back with the major results. Okay, great do this for another seven days, another. So we started out seeing that evidence. The reconciliation process just came with the fact that I saw these patients had make amazing changes in a very short time. I had never seen this in my life. I'd worked over two decades in the world's largest medical center. Two decades in the world's largest medical center. We have three heart transplant centers in walking distance in the Texas Medical Center. We have all the technology there was. And I was seeing heart failure patients, putting them on natural plant-based diets, and I saw them turn around in seven to 10 days. When I say turn around in seven to 10 days, I'm saying come up uh, from 21 medications down to one or two. I'm saying from wheelchairs to walking. I'm saying from oxygen to breathing, laughing and talking. Swelling would go down. Breathing would get better. We even saw evidence of ejection fraction improvement. I got data I'll discuss with you. We're getting ready to pre present a case. We saw hearts getting strong in a very short period of time. So when I saw these amazing changes, on a it wasn't just one or two times. It was every time I did it, every time the patient followed the, the, the regimen, they got better. I'd never seen anything like that in my career. So these amazing results that I saw were so powerful that in my mind, you know, even though this was a de very difficult thing to implement in the practice, I decided that there was no way I could not figure out how to make this work. So over the years, what we did was we worked out a process. We had boot camp classes, which are nutritional classes. We educated our patients at group sessions. Uh, we then had uh, group uh, educational programs. So we did a lot of things out of, outside the office uh, to enhance patients, give them support. Uh, we also uh, uh, had food demos. You know, we did shopping rounds and the like. Then our, pa our patients and clients would come back and say, well, look, we want to buy the food from you. So then we had to figure out how to sell the food. Well, guess what? We built a restaurant inside the clinic. And so now we have a nutrition center and a restaurant. We have wellness coordinators, nutritionists. We have, you know, chefs we brought in from around the world to help prepare natural plant-based foods according to our food classification system. So this has been an evolving process. Now, it hadn't been easy. Uh, you know, I, I, can, I can tell you in a separate show <laughs> all the headaches and difficulties we've gone through, and it, it's really made a big impact on my practice. But some of the things we've done of late, 
within the context of the medical practice that you know we know how to build for prolonged services and various things within the, the CPT codes, which allow us to capture revenue from that. We built a, an entire model for uh, food purchases. We're actually getting into the food business. I consider myself already in the food business. We're looking at developing a grocery store. We're going to start working with local farmers to control how the food is grown and the like. So there's a whole cascade of things that you know, has evolved over time, that's still evolving, it's developing as we go. This is my last question. I'm going to ask you, how do your colleagues view what it is that you're doing, and how do you re <laughs> resolve that? Well, I don't know what they say behind my back, but <laughs> I do know this. Um, one colleague is a friend of mine, actually. He's an interventional cardiologist. So in 2011, my book came out. I asked them to, when I was, you know, publishing my book, I asked them to, you know, read it and, and you know, write support for it. So um, he wrote a, a line or two of support, and in that line it says, this controversial diet. Now, the individual uh, uh, publisher I was working with said, can he ask me to take the word controversial out? So I talked to him. He says, no, it won't take controversial out. His opinion is that, yeah, this is okay, but this is controversial stuff. Didn't believe in it. That was 2011. Over the years, you know, I you know, visit him, Super Bowl games and the like, and, of course, he sees how I eat. Uh, he would see patients I would see from time to time. Uh, and he evolved. So he started asking more questions. Then, you know, he asked me to bring some of my food to the Super Bowl party for other people to eat. Then I started having him refer patients to me. Now he says, any patient who needs a stent or bypass, I tell him you must go on a plant-based diet. That's his wow. evolutionary process. Another individual college uh, colleague of mine, individual cardiology colleague of mine, refers patients you know, who are you know, uh, in stage uh, for the purpose of reversing their, line, their, their diets and reversing the heart disease. So there are a number of my colleagues whom I know uh, recognize the benefit and the power of what we're doing because you, cannot, you, know, you can't really overlook the results that the patients are getting. Dr. Baxter Montgomery, you're truly a pioneer. And I think you, to be, you need to be congratulated, first of all, being bold enough to stick with what you believe and then what the science had you to go from belief to knowledge. So I really thank you for this, this time and looking forward to hearing the rest of the lecture in just a few minutes. Thank you very much.